Good evening, friends and JASA members. The Japanese Art Society of America's mission is to promote the study and appreciation of Japanese arts and culture. We accomplish this by publishing a peer-reviewed scholarly annual journal, Impressions, and by scheduling lectures on Japanese art, as well as trips to museums and private collections. In this time of sheltering in place, JASA is pleased to offer its series of virtual programs. As a member of the program committee, I am delighted to welcome you to our annual special guest lecture and holiday party. I know how much our members look forward to meeting in person to celebrate the holiday season. But from the comfort of our own homes, we have the pleasure of listening to John Carpenter, the Mary Grigsburg Curator of Japanese Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Tonight, he will speak on one of the key Hokusai paintings in the Mets collection, a work that has received new attention in recent years through the monographic exhibitions at the Freer and Sackler Galleries in Washington, the Grand Palais in Paris, the Obuse Museum in Osaka, and the British Museum, and was featured most recently in the Poetry of Nature exhibition, celebrating the gift of the Fishbein and Bender collection at the Met in 2018. This evening, John will delve more deeply into this documentary work an image of Shoki, the demon queller, painted in 1847. Before John begins his talk, I would like to emphasize that he has had been the very active curator of Japanese art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art since 2011. Prior to that, he was a professor at SOAS in London and was recognized for his outstanding scholarship on Japanese text and images. His special exhibitions at the Met have been extraordinarily important and wonderfully attended. As JASA members know well, John has always been so thoughtful to invite us to join his focused gallery tours and public programs. In this manner, he has set an impressive bar that our museum colleagues in sharing a bar for our museum colleagues and friends in sharing his deep knowledge with public audiences. Speaking of bars, I hope you will all join us to celebrate our holiday party. We have invited mixologist Hilary Tolman to prepare a special libation. I hope you will enjoy Joss's special holiday cop cocktail, the Demon Queller. And just for your information, we have put the recipe in the chat and we've also added a link to the Met Museum's painting so that you can read further about it on your own. So on behalf of JASA, may I welcome John Carpenter. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you so much, Helen, for helping out with the technical side of things. Thank you, Allison and Victoria, for all you do for JASA. I'm delighted to be here tonight. I wish I could be speaking in person, but what I'd like to share with you tonight are my thoughts on what we've all been going through during the past year when the entire world is facing once in a lifetime pandemic. And of course, we all realize how art can give solace during this kind of traumatic time. But I'd like to focus in my comments tonight specifically on how Japanese people and Japanese artists through the centuries, through the millennia, have used art, artistic expression, creativity to respond to the terrible ravages of disease. 
And as I was thinking of this topic, I realized that we go all the way back to the very beginning, the first creative impulse in Japan, when during the Jomon period, figurines were created, the dogu. And at the archeological sites where these have been found, it's been noted that so many of them have broken arms or a leg or both legs broken off. And it seems as though these must have been broken intentionally. And what archeologists have long felt is that they had a ritual purpose. They were used for healing, that they were effigies of sort for people who were suffering illnesses. We also theorize that uh, they were used for fertility, for helping pregnant women. But this is the earliest instance we know in Japan of artistic forms being used for ritual healing. But as we reflect on the history of Japanese art, of course, it is the role of Buddhism and Buddhas as healing forces. And when looking at the history of the development of Buddhism in Japan and going back to Nara where Buddhism became an official religion, I was interested to see that around 735, Japan was ravaged by a terrible epidemic thought to have come from the continent and it destroyed a third of the Japanese population at this time. And Emperor Shomu had remorse. He was a leader who felt that he had failed the people in some way. And he decided to commission the building of Todaiji Temple. And you can see a reconstruction in Nara even today. At the time, it was the greatest Buddhist, largest Buddhist building in the world. And of course, commissioned was the great Buddha, the, the great Buddha that is there today is the second uh, reconstruction of the original uh, Buddha that was meant to alleviate the gods of disease. And as you all know, if you've visited Nara, it's an absolutely gigantic statue. And here in the annual cleaning, you can see that the scale is to demonstrate how important the Buddhist faith was to the government of Japan. And to further get a sense of the scale, just the, the annual cleaning of the great Buddha where you see the men appropriate in dust masks, but it's a reminder that uh, Japanese are so accustomed to wearing masks regularly uh, for everyday tasks. It's uh, so appropriate. And what I find remarkable is even to this day, since April of this year, there have been monks praying every day at noon for the alleviation of the novel coronavirus. Then when we look at the history of, of Buddha and the historic Buddha and this scroll from the Burke collection that are, we received in 2015, showing the historic Buddha being confronted by the demon king Mara and attacked by demons, but the historic Buddha sitting in quiet contemplation is able to repel the, the demons. The sister of King Mara 
carrying uh, skulls. And then his power of concentration was so great that he was able to stop arrows in mid-flight and swords that were being hurled at him and boulders being tossed, stopped in midair. And so remarkably, it was all of the, the terrible storms, the lightning, the thunder were transformed into blossoms and the, the dragon's breath turned into a fragrant uh, breeze. And so we have the historic Buddha as being the archetypal defender against evil and against demons. Now, the most important Buddha, when it comes to the idea of healing, of course, is the medicine master Buddha in Japanese, Yakshi, Yakshi Yorai. And when you come to the Met, of course, even today, you are greeted when you enter the Asian wing by the monumental wall painting of the medicine master Buddha. Notice he is garbed in a red robe, a color that will be associated with healing. And he is surrounded importantly by the 12 divine guardian generals. Yakshinyorai, the medicine master Buddha, becomes such an important icon in Japanese temples at Horyuji, the seventh century, the Shaka triad on the right becomes one of the most revered icons in that temple. Yui Suzuki has written a brilliant monographic study of the worship of Yakshi Nyorai in Heian, Japan. And images such as the Jingoji statue is so powerful, this kind of brooding, powerful medicine master Buddha holding the medicine jar, a symbol of healing, but here and the, the idea of have no fear, but still, this is a powerful, very brooding a force and a very strong early Heian manifestation of the medicine master Buddha. The Buddha that can cure all forms of disease, but also so importantly can cure ignorance which is a malady that's often tied together with physical disease. Now to assist the medicine master Buddha, of course, I've mentioned already the 12 guardian generals, the 12 divine generals, the Juni Shinsho. And here we have in a very early iconographic a drawing from Kozanji that just shows one of the the guardian kings. And you can see the iconography at work that's going to be so important to these kings, uh, a fearsome disposition, the fearsome continence holding the Vajra ritual implement, a symbol of the power, the symbol of the strength, the symbol of the truth of Buddhism. And this will be a weapon that can be used to fight disease. And to accompany statues of Yakshin Yorai in 2015, also part of the Burke collection, was this wonderful set of six of the 12 of the divine uh, generals. And when you look at them, you can see all the attributes and know that these are among the figures that were prayed to 
to cure diseases of one's loved ones and your family. But as I mentioned before, you prayed to the divine generals for protection against leaders who were insane or ignorant. And so you could see the dynamic force and this wonderful expressions on each one distinctive in its own way. And my very favorite is to see this general who is looking at you and you just say that you want him on your side as he fights off the demons of disease. Now, often on display since 2015 is the statue of uh, Fudomyo by Kaike. And notice that Fudo holds the sword that has the Vajra uh, pestle as, the, as its hilt. And Fudo also is a slayer of, of ignorance, a defender of the faith, and a protective figure. And even the sword of Fudomyo, whose name means Im immovable, meaning that he's so strong, he'll defend the faithful against the most terrible forces of evil or disease. And even Fudomyo's sword can be used to sever the, the poisons of the mind. But when we get to Japanese art, what do the demons actually look like? And of course you go to any culture and there's a diverse colorful iconography of devils, of demons. And I think that Japan probably has one of the most colorful and sometimes bizarre iconographies of, of demons. And one motif that comes up again is the night parade of the 100 demons. And here you can see the most marvelous array of outlandish uh, demons and they will all disappear um, when the sunrise comes, but in the middle of the night, the, the demons run wild. And Kawanabe Kyosai picked up on the same theme in his um, illustrated book of 1890 when he created the, the story of the hundred uh, demons and people gathering around um, a fire and enjoying uh, ghost stories. And once again, you can see Kyosai drawing on this marvelous tradition of the most bizarre imaginable uh, demons and just the imaginative uh, creativity that goes into the creation of these images is quite astounding. And then sometimes like the Ibaraki demon, the, the hag who has to try to recover her severed arm and you see it uh, carrying away. She had lost her arm in a battle with uh, Watanabe no Tsuna and, and had, uh, had to sneak back to recover it. And here she's fleeing with, uh, with uh, the severed arm. And you can see in this case, a demon is presented as an old woman, has human characteristics, but at the same time exaggerated to project the feeling of evil. Now among the most delightful of demons, I think, are those of the Otsue, Otsue created from the 17th to the 19th century and they are folk portraits of demons, of other uh, themes as well. But you can just see a playful aspect of showing 
demons and the presentation of these uh, paintings in many ways are meant to be talismans to protect you against uh, demons. And also in the 18th century, the Zen master Hakuin created this dynamic calligraphy once again with the large character Ma, referring to Mara, the demon king that I introduced earlier in my talk. And here is Hakuin creating a calligraphy with a Buddhist prayer that will guard against the demons. And when you look at the strength, the bold, brusque handwriting of the character for demon, you can see the energy that Hakuin put in as a man of faith. His calligraphy represents the strength of this battle against evil. And more playful demons, if you're up in the musical instruments galleries, uh, right now you'll see on display a very playful representation of, of demons with the gong imagery drawn from the Otsue. And then, of course, uh, Murakami Takahashi continues, even to this day, to play on the tradition of Oni, or uh, demons, in these bizarre modern statements. Now, I want to move to the focus of my talk, uh, I would like to look at the Japanese versions of uh, uh, John Gui, pronounced uh, Shoki in Japanese. And Shoki or John Gui is a Chinese uh, god of literature. He had excelled in the civil service. Um, examinations, but um, according to legend, um, he was considered so ugly he didn't get the, the recognition for his um, exams and he drowned himself. But later the Tang Emperor had a dream of being attacked by demons and uh, Zhang Gui appeared in his dream and and subdued the demons. And so the uh, Zhongui was uh, posthumously allowed to pass the exam civil examination. And he became associated with the idea of being a subduer, a queller of demons. And so Japanese artists and Japanese writers played with this tradition and took it to new lengths. Um, Masanobu on the, on the right shows a fierce, very harsh um, countenanced scholar, full beard, wielding a sword, this kind of dynamic, fierce imagery became associated with uh, Shoki in Japan. And uh, Koryu Sai was emulating an idealized uh, Sesshu ink painting of the fierce uh, demon queller. And so we have a whole tradition in 18th century Japan of creating these image of dynamic figures, full beard, the scholars had, and very bold outlines representing uh, a Chinese ink painting style. And in the print medium, perhaps one of the great culminations of Masanobu's work was his black shoki image with a very fierce looking 
Shoki, an image that would influence subsequent print artists and painters of the ukiyo-e school. Among them was Hokusai, of course. And I show you a appearance of the black shoki from the Mets uh, collection. Uh, you'll notice uh, just uh, several months ago, it was in rather a damaged condition, uh, but in the past couple of months, despite the um, terrible restrictions caused by uh, COVID, uh, Jennifer Perry was able to work her uh, magic to bring this Shoki painting uh, back to life. And you can see that there were uh, creases and cracks across the face that were about to destroy the painting. The seal of the Hyaku seal representing um, Hokusai's desire to live to be a Hyaku, to live to be 100. It is a painting we notice by the signature that it was created by Hokusai. He signs himself Manji, an old man of 90 years. This painting was created in Kai Tu, which is 1849, the year that Hokusai died. It's created in the Shogat. So the first month of 1849, this is the old man Hokusai trying to defy a death. He had hoped to live to be 100, to be 110. But he created these images of Shoki throughout his entire career. You can see the bold lines here, and there are other versions of this uh, painting, some uh, perhaps by students. This uh, seal seems to line up with the accepted Hyaku seal of Hokusai. And so here we have Hokusai making this declaration that he wants to fight the demons of disease in his final months. He wants to fight the demon of death. But even more remarkable in Hokusai's corpus are his images of Red Shoki. Here we have an image of Red Shoki that Hokusai created at the beginning of his career, 50 years before the Black uh, Shoki. He is using the name uh, Shunro, and you see this dynamic Red Shoki destroying a demon. And so we see that this kind of, this kind of imagery of the red shoki becomes very important in Hokusai's career. And when we do a little bit more research, we realize that red images of shoki were thought to be talismanic in efficacy against smallpox. And as Amy mentioned, this dates to 1847, 1847 when a smallpox epidemic ravaged Japan. And so Hokusai was creating this, this work when he's 87 years old in response to a smallpox epidemic and the most remarkable fears of Shoki in this case, looking directly at the viewer 
and also looking the disease right in the face and quelling the pain and quelling the disease that would kill so many people that year. Red, of course, has great importance to Hokusai and images such as his red Fuji immediately call to mind all the symbolism associated with this color with curative properties. But then we also see more playful representations and this image from uh, Boston Museum of Fine Arts is delightful. Um, Sinead Vilbar brought this to my attention when she saw I was going to write about the red shoki. And here you have, once again, you see the, the, the shoki, a banner being put out for Boys Day. And this is not only to cure smallpox, but it is encouraging the the young boys in the fifth day of the fifth month to be as strong as the demon queller. But in this case, you can see at the same time, uh, the, the little boys are having a little bit of fun on that occasion while the smudge pots are trying to destroy the mosquitoes that bring the terrible diseases. And we'll see once again, Kawanabe Kyosai, evoking Hokusai's great earlier images. Kyosai, who saw himself as a modern day Hokusai, takes the image and once again reminds us of the early Hokusai red Shoki destroying the demons of disease and we see this wonderful display for a uh, boy's days of uh, the carp banner and the, the, the cock on the drum representing a peaceful world and destroying disease. And so the imagery of this Kyosai uh, painting is reminding us of not just what is prayed for on boy's day, but what everyone praise for a, a peaceful world, destruction of disease. And we see it again in a Kuniyoshi Surimono, the same kind of koi carp banner with the red shoki. And anyone who collects uh, Netsuke will know that one of the most popular motifs uh, of Netsuke carving is uh, Shoki subduing uh, demons. A small subset of Japanese prints, the Akae, absolutely delightful. Often they are created to uh, correspond to uh, the relevant year, zodiac year, and they often include a simple poem just to pray for good health and long life. And one of my uh, favorite ones that I've uh, seen recently just has a poem that plays on the idea that like the spinning of a top goes on and on for a long, long time, just the same way we'd like to live for a long, long time, as long as the, the ears of a rabbit, just a playful, punning poem, but it is an antidote uh, to the, the misery that smallpox was bringing. Now, there are other ways that Japanese have traditionally addressed disease that comes on a regular basis. And of course, one of the most famous is the, the Gion festival that you can see in the Rakutsu Rakugaizu, the scenes in and around Kyoto, where 
one of the most famous details that always appears in every uh, version of these screens is the Gion Festival, which many of you have perhaps seen in Kyoto. It's been performed uh, regularly for uh, centuries here in the earlier in the around the turn of the century, you see the bustle associated with uh, the, the Gion Festival. And even in more recent years, you can see how Japanese preserve this festival, which began actually all the way back in the Heian period, ninth century. It was a response in Kyoto to the terrible muggy summers of Kyoto that brought pestilence and brought disease. And this was a way to placate the disease uh, demons. And it's carried on up until modern times. I was sad to hear that uh, this year um, it had to be canceled, of course, because you did not want large uh, clusters of people to uh, get together as usual, but actually, the ritual performance, the purification rites associated with uh, the Gion festival are as important as ever. Now, you might not realize, but in the early 18th century, the Shogun declared that fireworks would be a way to purify disease and he commissioned the, the great fireworks displays over the Sumida River that still can be seen uh, today. Uh, this year, I, I know they were canceled again, but hopefully they'll be resumed uh, next year. And this took place since the 18th century. You see it in uh, Hiroshige's prints of views of Edo and uh, Kiyochika's marvelous play with a uh, light of the fireworks with the lanterns, the silhouettes of the spectators, a reminder that this remained important through the Meiji period. And even uh, today, you can see the fantastic fireworks displays over the Sumida River. And we look forward to them being resumed very soon. But don't want to say that everything was just praying to the gods or relying on uh, supernatural um, cures for disease. The Western medicine had um, started to enter in the Edo period and various types of traditional Chinese medicine also were had efficacy. And some of these are a little bit surprising. Um, for instance, when this painting, a, a gift of uh, the late uh, Richard Fishbein and uh, Estelle Bender was presented to the Met uh, officially last year, I was uh, surprised to learn that not only are silkies, um, these uh, chicken-like birds that have um, plumage as soft as the fur of a kitten and Marco Polo was astounded when he saw these. But as I did a little bit more reading on these, I, I realized that silkies were actually used for medicinal purposes. A soup was made from their bones and they have uh, black bones and this had curative properties. And when I did a little bit more reading about it, I realized that still, and uh, it's very common to find in China, this kind of a soup made from silkies. And perhaps, um, something special about this tour de force of avian painting from the Edo period is that when we looked at the box in which the wooden box in which this painting came, it actually was commissioned 
by a medical officer of the shogunate. So it's a reminder that this very unusual painting in Mori Sosen's corpus was commissioned by a doctor. There's just one other example of a painting of silkies uh, by Mori Sosen that is known. And other types of treatments, um, uh, some are more reliable than others perhaps, but uh, in this 19th century print about slaying uh, cholera, um, according to this, uh, plum vinegar is supposed to be a panacea for curing cholera. I don't know if that's uh, really effective in any way, but I was uh, interested to discover when I was trying to figure out the strange iconography of how the beast of cholera was depicted, I, I see that there were various ways of writing uh, cholera, uh, korori, korori, and korori, when you read, is written with uh, phonetic characters that literally mean um, a tiger, a wolf, and a tanuki. And here, the cholera beast is depicted as having the head of a tiger, the body of a wolf, and the testicles of a tanuki. A, quite a bizarre uh, beast, but it gets the point across. And of course, I mentioned uh, 1849 was the year that Hokusai uh, created that very impressive black shoki painting, probably in response to his own illness. But coincidentally, 1849 is the year that vaccination using the cowpox uh, virus was already being used in the West and it just started in Japan at the same time. And so they are addressing these diseases using Western medicine as well, though artists would take a, a playful approach to the idea of uh, the cowpox, uh, cowpox vaccination uh, and showing this uh, kind of a playful imagery to get the message across that um, vaccination is a good thing. And here we have the, a print showing how even in the 19th century, how print artists will still call on the ancient gods and ancient emperors to help in the cure of disease, even as excellent medications come into, the, into common use. Now, I'd like to bring my presentation to a close by just mentioning that some important dates are coming up and I hope they will allow us to reflect and deal with the collective trauma that we're going through. And of course, you're less than a week away, the winter solstice is upon us and in England, of course, people usually flock to Stonehenge to observe the rising of the sun, a symbol that the previous night was the longest night of the year, the darkest depths of despair. But the winter solstice, it starts to give hope that the sun is going to rise in the sky. This year, no one can visit in person but you can watch on the English heritage site, the Stonehenge, the sun appearing between the great monumental stones. In Japan, you can celebrate the winter solstice, perhaps uh, near, if you're near Waseda, go to the Anahachimangu shrine, walk through the Tori gates. You can see the statue representing the Yabusane of the mounted archery that once again, the Shogun Yoshimune had 
allowed to happen on the, the grounds that was thanking the shrine for curing the smallpox of his son, who would be the next shogun. So this shrine is associated with both curing of smallpox, but also with the celebration of the winter solstice. And they sell uh, talismans at the counter. And if you look at them, they, they read uh, Ichiyo uh, Raifuku, meaning this is going to be the, the return of the, the yang of return of the positive energy. So yin, the negative energy is leaving, meaning the darkness of winter is leaving. Ichiyo, the sun is rising, the forces of yang are rising. So it's a very positive feeling. And one thing they sell at the shrine are the, the use of the little citruses that can be used for the hot tub bath that you are supposed to take next week in the winter solstice. I recommend it for everyone. And then the date that we all really want to look forward to is next February for the Setsubun festival. This is just the day before spring according to the lunar calendar begins, but this is such an important day. This is when all of us can finally say, Aoni wa soto, fuku wa uchi, the idea that the demons be gone and good luck come in. And then you see throughout Japanese art history, playful depictions of the good luck personified um, this, the daitoku coming in, good luck coming in and the poor little uh, demon worried that his beans are about to be scattered upon him as he's being forced out. This is a celebration of the setsubun and calling to mind once again, the dynamic power of the kabuki stage when you have an actor of the Ichikawa school in very earliest stages, tossing beans at Setsubun to scare the demon away. Once again, we see recalling this image of the fierce, very powerful figure forcing away demons, holding a sword. It's drawing on the imagery of Shoki the demon queller. I hope this lecture has allowed you to reflect a little bit on how we are able to deal with this terrible pandemic that we are facing, but at the same time have hope that things will improve, that things will return to normal and that the demons of disease can be vanquished by springtime. Thank you very much. John, this is Amy. I'd like to join you on the podium to thank you as I'm sure everyone is mesmerized and mystified as to how you took us beneath the surface to really explore so fully all of the perspectives and ramifications that we find in Japanese Buddhist art and Japanese folk art taking us through the centuries and we see these universal themes and ideas. And uh, this is a, such a, a phenomenal presentation for us, John, and shows us once again that uh, it, we need time to really explore each subject, just as you have helped us this evening. 
we have very we have many many friends here tonight and i want to invite people to uh please raise your hand or ask questions because we we only have a few moments but we do have enough time for a few uh questions if anyone or comments please Before we, well, while some questions are coming uh, to the forefront, I would like to ask you uh, something that's more on the pragmatic side about the Mets collections. And of course, I was so happy to see the newly restored uh, Black Shoki. Uh, but I wanted to ask you to explain to us something of the three different versions that you have in the collection, uh, all donated at the same time by uh, Charles Stewart Smith. Could you speak a bit to, to that topic? Um, Amy, uh, the Charles uh, Stewart Smith collection uh, transformed the Met at an early stage. It's, um, we don't know all of the, the sources, but what um, I remember in checking some of that he, he did have access to um, sources such as uh, Captain Brinkley's uh, connections. And of course, Brinkley um, uh, knew Kyosai and uh, uh, Josiah Condor. And so I wonder if there's a, a little bit of a, a connection through those sources, but I haven't uh, done any further research on where the individual works uh, came from. Uh, Something uh, quite remarkable is that many of the ukiyo-e paintings um, have turned out to be a very um, um, high quality and they deserve further study. And these two shoki paintings that I introduced uh, tonight are, are among those. Thank you. On a different note, uh, Mira Harada asks, what was the little rabbit in the hair of the uh, <laughs> guardian that you showed earlier? Oh, well observed. Isn't it interesting when you look at how fierce the Kozanji iconographic drawing looks at the general, and then all of a sudden you have this little rabbit sticking out of the, uh, the, the head. Um, it actually, is a reminder that the 12 uh, divine generals are also linked uh, to the 12 uh, animals of the East Asian uh, zodiac. And so each one is accompanied by uh, one of the figures, but in that case, it creates a interesting uh, um, juxtaposition. It's related, each is tied to one of the animals of the zodiac. Another member of our audience asks a fascinating question related to the uh, representation of medicinal plants. Um, you, you just focused on that very briefly. And as well, is there a Dr. Fauci figure represented in Japan? Uh, uh, that is the interesting thing is, uh, if I had more time, I found um, a, a 19th century a doctor, a medical treatise, and it's quite remarkable. It talks about the treatment of smallpox. And one of the primary recommendations for the treatment of smallpox by this uh, uh, 19th century uh, doctor is a quarantine. He says, don't go out. And he says, uh, follow um, uh, hygiene, good hygiene, and uh, uh, do not uh, engage in large banquets. So it's, it's interesting. This is uh, over um, 150 years ago. And uh, there, so in those times, there, there was a Dr. Fauci. And um, uh, they were also um, the, the innovative um, um, doctors who started studying Western medicine uh, were, were revolutionaries in their time. Another question, and there have been several that are raising the points about present day Japan, uh, whether it's pop art or otherwise, as is there uh, a, a new emergence of demon imagery used now? 
yeah. uh, for as a means of coping with COVID-19? And if so, what type of images? Uh, yes, I actually had a few images that uh, the Ama BA and uh, other manga images. It's an entire lecture in itself. And I started to put some of them in, but then when I started searching a little bit more, I realized it's just um, mushroomed into an incredible uh, topic in the last uh, nine months. Entire um, manga dedicated to uh, uh, curative figures and magical figures, and, um, uh, figures with magical powers that are similar to those of the Edo period. So it's remarkable. The idea of the demon queller has been brought into modern times and it is uh, uh, quite fascinating. So yes, it's, um, it's you could find um, um, dozens and dozens of new uh, uh, characters that have been drawn, uh, drawn from the past. Some borrowed from the late Edo period, some completely um, novel creations. And finally, our last question has is, uh, and everyone has mentioned what a fascinating presentation this has been, John. Was there a belief that red koshimaki served as a protection against contagious diseases? And from what time? Now, the, uh, I included the original uh, picture of the medicine master Buddha from, that's from the 14th century. Uh, from the Metz collection. But the interesting thing is that this idea as red as having talismanic power against smallpox, it's been present uh, from a very early uh, time. The other thing I discovered in which I couldn't elaborate on at all was how important the color red was also in medieval Europe. This was a universal uh, recognition of the talismanic power of the color red and found instance after instance you know, of, of queens being dressed entirely in red garments when they were suffering from um, smallpox and uh, measles. And uh, this is, uh, it was remarkable. And I see that it is something that wasn't just Japan, it wasn't just uh, East Asia, but it was the entire world um, with this symbolism of the uh, color, the curative properties of the color red. There are, I'm sure there are many other questions, but those of us who are members of JASA know that we always end our programs promptly at 6 p.m. And so if you will excuse me, I have some business to do. Uh, first of all, in, in addition to thanking you, John, for your erudition, and sharing, as you always do, your, your deep, deep interest in the arts and what brought them to the fore. I also would like to uh, tell our members and our friends who are joining us today that our next program will be coming up in the new year. Um, and we will be, uh, we've invited uh, Professor Yukio Lippet, who would like to speak on the topic of Sesson and an important subject, which you'll be hearing about in the next few days as we send an announcement. As always, we wish all of you who've joined us this evening uh, to stay well uh, and to, if you would like to hear this lecture again, very shortly, JASA will have it on our website and you can find it on YouTube at our YouTube address. So to all a happy holiday and we look forward to seeing you in healthier and happier times. Thank you.